Hello, I'm Dave Moitz and welcome to Successful Farming. On today's program, I'm heading to a sale to track the prices being paid for John Deere S670 combines. And then we feature a no-till innovation built by a farmer. The engine man, Ray Bohax, is back with another one of his great repair and maintenance tips. And after these brief messages, I'll introduce you to our combine doctor, Rod Edgington. Rod will be walking us around the combine to point out must-do preseason repairs. So please stay tuned. Today on Top Shops, we're talking about combine repair and maintenance pre-season inspection, which is so crucial. My expert, my combine doctor is Rodney Edgington. You're with Combine Specialties. You're the founder and the operator here in Ulysses, Kansas. And you've, it's fair to say you've gone through a couple hundred combines in the yeah. time that you've been operating here. So it's prior to harvest. Doesn't matter whether it's wheat, barley, corn, soybeans, sunflowers. It's so important to get that combine in and take a look at it before the season starts, right? That's right. So in this case, what you're doing is you're doing a general inspection, but we're gonna go into some key points that a guy ought to look at. And let's start out with really where it all starts out. It, uh, it, we're not gonna talk about the header or the, uh, the uh, platform. We're gonna start with the feeder house right there. Um, with the feeder house itself, a lot of guys assume that nothing really happens up there when it comes to wear and tear, do they? Yeah, that's, that's the assumption, but there's, there's a lot of wear items in the feeder house that need to be addressed to make sure that you get that crop to that threshing system. You want to look at it all, right? That's correct. Um, and everybody associates the feeder house with just the, the feed conveyor chain. You know, the, the, the slats, you want to make sure there's no bent slats in that. Uh, you want to make sure that the attaching mechanism for each slat is on the chain. So whether it be bolts or rivets, rivets right. um, you want to make sure that's all attached. You know, spin that thing around and, and inspect every single one of them and make sure that, that they're all attached correctly and, and gonna, going to function correct. Um, you know, you don't see a lot of wear on slats. You know, most of the wear in the feeder house chain is going to be the chain itself. Mm. Um, a good indication that your chain is wore, you know, look at your top sprockets. They'll usually start getting cupped or the side, side wear right. on, on the sprocket itself. That's a good indication. And the cupping is pretty obvious. On the, right. It yeah. just cups into where the It'll make like a C-shaped right. pattern. And, and, you, and, and one very important step is don't ever put a, a new chain on a cupped sprocket you'll wear that chain out fast, extremely fast. Seriously, I didn't know yeah. that. So yeah. if you're replacing one, you better replace You need the to other. replace both, yes. The debate on the chains, when is it time to replace the chains? When it has so much slack in it, you've already adjusted it out to the full extent and now it's kind of slumping? Well, the general rule of thumb that I was, I was basically always taught was 3% elongation. So if you measure the total length of the chain, you push it together, you measure that point, pull it apart. If it's 3% more, replace your chain. As I do in the feeder house, or what, what I look for is, is if you have a, a new chain and you wear that down to where your adjustments are clear to the end, mm -hmm. you take your half link out and you wear it clear down to the end again, that's about the time that you need to replace it. How about the sheet metal? Does that ever wear down? Well, the feeder floor is, is usually a high wear item. Wear, right. um, a lot of times if you have a high excessive wear on your feeder floor, it's because your chain's not adjusted correctly. Oh, so you're dragging it's it. It's dragging it. Right. Uh, cons you know, or, or if, you, if you don't run your header full capacity mm -hmm. and, and you have, don't have enough material going through, it'll wear a hole through there. Other wear points you should look at in the feeder house when you're inspecting? Um, when I inspect it, I look at the drum, the drum arms. You want to mm -hmm. make sure there's two bearings, usually always two bearings in there and a shaft. Right. Um, uh, you know, depending on what model you're working on and what, what brand, you'll have bushings that can wear out. You'll have bolts that'll wear out through the, you know, your adjuster bolts that move forward right. and back. Right. Um, it's a pretty key point to make sure that that drum runs square right from the go. You don't want to have it crooked. You'll wear that feeder house chain out one more than the other. Right. So what I do is I measure 
the arms front and back and make sure that that's adjusted straight. Each side is adjusted equally at all times. The other thing about the feeder house, which oftentimes gets ignored, and probably what I assume is one of the most ignored things, is the drive system, the header that's, that's drive cool. system. Because yeah. you've got belts down there and, and mm -hmm. of course, variable shivs on some of the combines, depending on what kind of drive system. They use. Yeah, every application is a little different on the drive system, but you know, you always want to make sure that your drive belt is, is working correctly and adjusted correctly. I see a lot of misadjusted drive oh, really? belts on deer combines. With slack? With, with, with slack. a slack. Okay. Um, you want to make sure, especially on a variable drive, uh, like a reverser drive right. shiv. You want to keep the tension on that spring, on that reverser, that correct tension to keep the load capacity mm -hmm. at its optimal performance. So if you have that belt loose, the shivs are too close to each other and they won't put the correct squeeze on that belt. Oh, and that's so where the power transfers. Where the power transfers, the that's correct. The right. side of a belt's right. where the power goes through. So a lot of guys will misadjust their belt, maybe didn't know how to do that, or it needs to refer back to an operator's manual or a tech manual to, to, to do that correctly. If you have that variable sieve, do you need to check to see if it is moving in and out? Yes, what you want to do is run that clear to the slowest speed, and there's a measurement on a, on a John Deere that's an eighth of an inch between the shivs that you want to maintain a gap um, oh, okay. to, between the shivs, and that'll put that correct load on there. So we get the feeder house up to snuff, uh, we're going into threshing and separation. Right. Uh, but in the threshing itself, there's what's kind of crucial is that induction cone or that- Right, in transition cone. Transition cone, I'm right. sorry, that comes into it. Right. And that varies by make. Right, right. Each, each, each make has their own version of how they get that transitioning into the cone. Right. Um, but all the whole, every concept is almost identical. They all have some sort of impeller bar or uh, elephant ears, however they want to call it. Um, but, but what they do is they grab the material and get the transition equally going into, into the threshing system. Right. And, and a key point is to make sure that there's, there's no wear on those parts or, or excessive wear that throws your rotor out of balance. Or you want to make sure that the bolts and the hardware are attaching them correctly. Uh, the weights, the balance weights, a lot of time they'll put them on the impellers. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to get them balanced and you want to make sure that they're all attached correctly. Uh, there's no break, breakage in any of that or cracks. Um, and and that's, that's kind of a key factor there. What's, what's key about the feeder house from what I've understood talking with company reps of different manufacturers when it comes to adjustment in the field is the feeder house and the transition area are key to a smooth flow of crop into threshing right. to avoid Slugs, right? Slugs. Yeah, uh, slugs slugs in the thrashing system creates unthrashed material and it also causes vibration issues that you might think is an actual mechanic issue oh. uh, or mechanical issue. Right. With so, a drive. With a drive or, right. or with a rotor, you know, you might think something's wrong with your combine. It might just be slugs in there just creating a, an imbalance problem. Now, because of wear on a vein or crackage on a vein right. or, or elephant ears or whatever you're using. To yeah, you want, you want that material fed perfectly equal all the way around. You don't want a big slug going in one part of the rotor, nothing in the next section. Because actually you're taking material up on a horizontal plane, mm -hmm. right? It's coming in on a sheet right. and now you're, you're trying to... Wrapping it around it. Right, you're wrapping it because you're trying to get it to evenly flow around right. there. So that's why that's so crucial. Something else you want to look at is, is the actual cone itself for the transition plates. Really? Um, they have, you know, the, the, some manufacturers have veins that go around them. You don't want yes. the veins broke. You want to make sure they're all there, mm -hmm. uh, that they're not excessively worn, because if they're worn, they won't grab the material and start the twist right. that you want to get on that cone. Rodney, for more information about combine specialties, your business, where could a person go to contact you? Well, the best place would be uh, at CombineSpecialties.com. Your website. Then. My, res my website, yes. Right. Yeah. And you just don't do combines, do you? No, I don't. I do, I do everything ag equipment, tractors, you know, tractors and uh, grain carts, you know, anything, yeah. anything ag related. So. so all your repair and maintenance needs in western Kansas, Engines. eastern Colorado, yep. this is the place Engines, to come Engines, transmissions, uh, you name it, I can do it. So. Okay. Well, we'll see you again next week on another Top Shop Tour. Hi, Ray Bohax here, the successful farming engine man, and I'm over here on location in Columbiana, Ohio at the Firestone Farm Tire Test Facility. 
And though I really, really enjoy getting engines to run very strong, whether they're on a farm tractor, car, truck, combine, or what have you, the fact of the matter is they also have to stop. So today's segment is going to be a few tips about disc brake caliper service. Now, this is a disc brake caliper. It's uh, from a GM vehicle, but it's representative of what you'll find on almost anything. And what it is called is a floating caliper. And what a floating caliper means is that it has a single piston. This is the hydraulic piston that will press the pad out against the rotor, and it's going to float on these pins. By floating, it means that it moves back and forth. Now, for it to move back and forth, there's a bushing here, and then there's the pin that goes through it, and that also attaches the caliper to the, uh, to the mounting fixture. And this bushing will support it and actually act as a fulcrum, as a movement point. And as I said, the pads will ride in here. A common mistake that people make is they do not lubricate the moving parts on the caliper the physical moving parts, the mechanical parts, the pin and the bushing. And to do that, you need to have a special disc brake lubricant. This bushing here, now each caliper design is a little bit different, but they're basically all the same if it's a floating caliper. The opposite of a floating caliper is a fixed caliper, and that will have at least two pistons, a piston on this side and a piston on that side. But most applications use a floating caliper. And what you would do is you would lubricate the, the bushing, the O-ring, and then the slide points. Once you do that, all of the hydraulic energy that is created by the master cylinder to push the pad against the rotor will be used to stop the vehicle and not consumed by the friction of the pin and the bushing in the bore. Now, if you take the wheel off of a car or anything with a disc brake caliper and you notice uneven wear of the pads, usually what you'll notice is that the pad that is attached to the piston will be less worn than the outside pad. That is showing that the caliper is sticking and not floating back and returning. And eventually that one pad will wear out and cause you to do a brake job. If I can answer any questions that you have about brakes, calipers, engines, or what have you on the farm shop, please feel free to contact me at sfengineman at agriculture.com. And please make sure that all the slide points on the caliper are lubricated and functioning properly, not only for safety, but to make sure you get the most life out of your brakes. You have a blessed day, and I'll see you next time in Columbiana. Are you looking to cash in on good deals being offered on late model John Deere S670 combines? Then join me at sale to see what they're selling for after these brief messages. Welcome to Steel Deals. What's the best deal in steel these days? Combines like these Class 7 harvesters. There are nine such combines, all John Deere S670s, up for sale at today's auction. Now, this is a collection of 2012 to 2014 machines. So, for comparison purposes, I'm going to pick out the premium machine among the lot. That would be this 2014 S670 with four-wheel drive. This machine has just over 775 hours, separator hours that is, a four-year-old combine with less than 800 separator hours? Imagine that. Plus, it comes fully equipped with high torque feeder house, 650-85R duals, a high rate unload auger, bend extensions, HID lighting, three-speed transmission, contour master header control, and that rear wheel drive. This is the best machine in this mass of combines up for sale today at this dealer dispersal auction. But will it bring a premium price? See, I highly doubt that. Back before commodity prices crashed in 2014, a combine like this would have been fought over. Today, they litter dealer's lots and auction yards in huge numbers. I checked on John Deere's dealer listing website, machinefinder.com, and found over 1,100 Model S670s for sale. And what about just 2014 Model Year S670s? There were 244 of them sitting on dealer's lots. So it's safe to say that Class 7 combines are an ample supply. What effect will that have on bidding at today's auction? To get an answer to that, let's talk to one of the representatives at Sullivan Auctioneers, the organization putting on today's auction. 
We're speaking with Matt Sullivan of Sullivan Auctioneers, and we were looking at that S670, the four-wheel drive. First of all, Matt, that's fairly well loaded with equipment. Yep. I mean, that was full-figured when it left the dealership way well, back four years ago. <laughs> for sure. But the thing is, there are still a lot of Class 7 combines yep. out in the marketplace, the, the, late, the late model, low hour type of machines, right? There definitely is, yeah. But, you know, there's, like you said, there's a lot of combines for sale. But I would think that being able to buy one in a situation like this on an absolute auction, you know, coming from a John Deere dealer, I would think it'd be a great opportunity to, to, uh, to get a combine that you, you know where it came from and the history of it and the service records of it. Mm -hmm. You don't need to explain it because we're at a dealer inventory reduction sale, aren't we? That's correct. And they'll come along every so once in a while. Are these kind of the premium auctions to go to if you had to go to one? I, I feel like they are. You know, there's, there's financing available. There's, you can get all the service records. Um, you know, I, I think it's a great opportunity to get a good deal on a combine, yes. But the thing is, we still have a lot of S670s out there, yeah. and the prices are gonna be competitive. If you had to look down the road two to three years from now, if you bought that combine today, you know, isn't there a good chance it may be worth as much on a trade in three, four years from now than what you paid for it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the new ones still go up every year. So that makes your used ones, you know, worth as much or more. I think if you took good care of it, you know, and kept the hours reasonable, I think it'd, it'd be worth is, yeah, you're right. At least what you paid for it, if not a tick more. So if I had to kind of ask you, if I were looking, that's, that's a full figured S670 with four wheel drive. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any idea for a 2014 combine with less than 800 separator hours? What would you get for a combine like that? You, you know, I would think that that combine hopefully would bring, uh, you know, 175, 185,000 in that ballpark, something like that. Wow. Matt, thanks for that information. Let's watch the S670 sell. Betting just finished on the 2014 S670. Recall that this was the pick of the crop among this long line of S670s that sold today. The final bid, 177,500. I have a prediction to make. The farmer who bought this combine will be able to run it for a couple years and then either sell it or trade it in for the same money he paid for for that combine today. I make that prediction because manufacturers cut their output of Class 7 combines like this by two-thirds since 2015, so the marketplace will be lean on the popular Class 7 late model used harvesters in the future. And that will maintain the values of machines like this on into many years. 
Speaking of values, I highly recommend that you go to websites like MachineFinder.com or IronSolutions.com to track the sale of equipment prior to heading to an auction or dealer's lot. You can find machines comparable to the one you're interested in and then bid or bargain in confidence. Now, for more information about Sullivan Auctioneers, go to the website, SullivanAuctioneers.com and you can catch my Machinery Insider Equipment Price Trend Analysis in every issue of Successful Farming Magazine. See you next week on another Steel Deals Report. After these brief messages, we feature a great no-till innovation by a farmer. So please stay tuned. Hello, this is Gary Nonamaker. I'm showing you an idea that I built several years ago when I first went into no-till farming. I had a problem with ditches in some of my fields come planting time and I built this to smooth out all the ditches and it worked really well to drive up and down the ditch. And this machine flexes in the middle so the disc fits right down in the disc and it does a nice job of filling it in. And after several years of no-till farming, I really haven't been using it very much because I've got a lot of residue on the ground and I don't have near the erosion. Originally, the green iron you see was a, a four-section Flex King V-blade undercutter. And I wanted it because it would flex in the middle. And then I took the wings off of it and I had these disc gangs I took off a, a disc that I had and, and I put it all together. And it took me several days but I really don't have very much invested in it. It's another one of them things that pretty much components I had around. But I, I enjoy building things like this when I get to go out and run them and reap the rewards. If I was going to build it again, I might not have taken the wings off of it and just had it that much wider so it, it'd feather in the dirt from a wider swath yet. But I'm pretty satisfied with it. I, I, I got a lot of good out of it the first two or three years when I used it. For more information about this idea and other farmer inventions, go to agriculture.com slash TV. Please join us next week for another outstanding show. Our combine doctor continues his inspection of a combine pointing out crucial pre-season repair and maintenance chores. The engine man, Ray of Bohax, is back with another one of his great repair and maintenance tips. On steel deals, I track the latest values on late model combines. We travel to northern Iowa to take in a great outdoor display of classic horsepower. See you next week right here on Successful Farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already, and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video. And click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.